If you've ever heard of a song by Hathaway, What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. You may remember that tune. So my name is Vladislav pretty much. Blood is love. Baby, don't hurt me. So right, guys, I'm um, boys and girls. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the first episode of another Russian. So I was told by my fellow buddy in India that I met 12 years ago, Ragadendra, that she do it. So here's my story. On February 22, 2021, me and my wife, we, oh sorry, 22, 22. Me and my wife, we went to Istanbul. So I'm Russian born. I'm, I come from Euros, which is known for ending Russian monarchy pretty much, literally. And um, we've been living in Moscow for quite some time. We've been married for a year to that moment. And we went to Istanbul uh, on a romantic weekend for four nights, if I remember correctly. And um, we left, we bought those tickets in January without any notion of what were about to happen in February, specifically on February 24th, 2022. And um, we went there, we arrived, spent some time there. And on the 24th February, we we're supposed to go to a romantic place in the weekend. Yeah, it is like a hotel in a remote place. And we have a fireplace, a jacuzzi, and uh, we were supposed to spend our time and enjoying ourselves and you know just celebrating a year of being together almost we were married on march 6th and um so we're supposed to pick a car from the new part of istanbul so we were living in the old part of istanbul where all the kind of sites and uh, got well actually we were living in um, istiklal nearby it was pretty loud at that point in time. So we rented an apartment there until 24th, and then 24th we're supposed to go to this hotel. So we arrived at the new part of Istanbul, and uh, we were supposed to pick a car. And uh, it took us a while, because we didn't know where to go to and uh, how to get there. So we went on, we tried to go on a train or some, some sort. And while going there without having breakfast, because me and my wife, we can become really really annoyed when we don't eat in the morning so we were at each other's throats pretty much and um, all that stress piling up so we arrived to this place that I've been advised to by my uh, my ex-colleague Roman and um, said that it's a great place for breakfast and um, so we go there pissed at each other but you know in the need for a proper breakfast so we arrived there and we ordered croissant if I remember correctly, it was with Hamon or something like that, or maybe Salmon, I don't remember exactly. And we see people around us are like really enjoying their food, so we kind of, our mouths start to water pretty much at that point in time. And um, we order and we wait. And I open my text messenger, use Telegram, and the next colleague of mine, Sultanat, she, she writes me, Are you okay? I was like, yeah, why are you asking? She says that there's no fly zone over Ukraine. I was like, why? <laughs> she says the war has started. I was like, what the fuck? And we get those amazing cross sounds by that. Well, after. I got the message delivered to me and um, we don't really enjoy it at all because our lives are just flip upside down and um, bought an apartment in the end of 2018 in Moscow it's mortgage I had the down payment and then the rest is mortgage so I had my monthly installment payments for our dog which we adopted from a shelter at the age of uh, 11 months so that dog is a different story. I mean, there's a lot with her. So anyway, um, I got all this happening and we plan to come back and continue with our lives and 
being the, so far a year a managing director of Fanatic, marketing agency, strategic marketing agency, to be correct. And nowadays it is more of a marketing consultancy, pretty much, because of the level of expertise that we possess. However, that's not the point. What I was talking about, yeah, the, the reason my cloud, my train of thoughts is so kind of turning here and there is because I got high, and that's what I do <laughs> from time to time. Although recently on a permanent basis, no doubts about that. Anyway, so um, yeah, we have all this. We have plans to come back and um, you know tend to our dogs and our dog and our lives. And then this shit happens, so we decide to, you know, get the car, go to the hotel, because, yeah, what the fuck, I mean, the, the car is booked, we paid for it, the hotel is booked, we paid for it, like, seriously, what are we gonna do? And we get to there, it's not dealerships, like a place where you rent a car, and remember even the name of it, the brand. So we get there, we get a car, and uh, we go there, the road took us roughly an hour and a half or two and uh, while driving there on the empty road my wife was just doom scrolling and I was driving and um, she was just telling me what's happening like the news feed everything that that was going on live because it was the first day of the war conflict that initiated Vladimir motherfucker Putin so what he did is he decided that he can conquer a fucking land and get away with it because you know we had previous experience of doing with Crimea annexing it and then you know nothing followed there was like this level of empowerment that grows in you once you have certain level of power and then he decides like what the fuck why not go for it nobody's gonna do shit they're gonna complain they're gonna go to the UN and shit like that and not gonna do nothing sanctions schmanctions I mean Ah, at that point in time, sanctions didn't significantly affect Russian economy. It didn't crumble it for sure. So, you know, the guy felt empowered and decided, why not? He underestimated, clearly, luckily, his enemy. However, shit hit the fan at that point in time. And uh, we arrived to the hotel, check in. It's in the mountains, so in Istanbul there's no snow. But in the mountains, you go there and there's snow, like, a lot of snow, so some pieces of the road were like hardly uh, able, like allowed us to to get there. But once we got there, uh, we started to think like, what are we gonna do? And uh, we had no idea like what to do next. So uh, we decided to go around the lake that was nearby and just to try and uh, put our minds to something kind of exploring everything that's around us, but that didn't help much, so we did the, the, the circle, and uh, I came back, and uh, we have this jacuzzi, this fireplace, and we have like a bottle of wine with us, so we, we, we decided that, yeah, well, let's enjoy the time while we're here, I mean, what are we gonna do with this? So we sit in this jacuzzi, <laughs> open a bottle of wine, and it's just fucking doom scrolling, it's just, you know, you're stuck with the mobile device and you're just scrolling and trying to figure it out, trying to understand, like, get a, any sense of what is happening, like, why is this happening in the first place? And then, eventually, we went out to the jacuzzi and went to the fireplace. It was on the balcony, so there was snow, it's, like, really beautiful, like, extremely romantic and shit. It's supposed to be. And then we're just sitting at their fireplace, room <laughs> scrolling, and then on, so we decided to eventually cancel our tickets, fly back, got a refund and stayed. So we came to the regional place, to ask, asked them if we can stay, they gave us a night, and then we said that it was booked. So it was an Airbnb, so we found a new place and uh, rented it rapidly for roughly two or three weeks or so, I don't remember. And then we got there and we started to think like, what are we gonna fucking do? like seriously and uh, the, the thoughts that been running through my mind is that that was like for me being the citizen of this country there was this was one fucking giant red line and that motherfucker just crossed it so you know and that, that's it for me it was a point of no return I could no longer imagine myself living in a country that 
initiated a war in the 21st century. Like, seriously, dude, take some acid. Get, take this steam off, you know? Like, talk to yourself. Connect with mother fucking nature, dude. Like, think about it. Do you really just want to kill human beings? Are you fucking this stupid? Like, seriously, man. This is, like, the level of stupidity is sublime. Uh, anyway, so we go on thinking, like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And my wife, she works as a um, product designer at that point in time for a manless autonomous uh, mobiles, automobiles, like, like they just drive by themselves. So basically, she was developing the interface and the company, the entire structure belonged to a giant called Zber. It is like an IT conglomerate or shit like that in, in Russia. It was based out of the bank with a huge history, which resulted in like 50% of the entire banking system of the country. And then at some point of time, they started to transform digitally and uh, acquire new businesses and build this like ecosystem pretty much. So my wife was working there for, for this, well, the mother company's there is state owned pretty much. I, at that point in time, work in a marketing agency, Fanatic. At that point in time, it wasn't widely called strategic marketing agency, in my view, but nevertheless. And um, I'm thinking like, what am I gonna do? But luckily for me, I had this experience of working in remote, and uh, the 2020 taught us all well, me at least. So what I did, I, I remember precisely, I've been working at this British negotiation consultancy called The Gap Partnership. And I've been teaching people how to negotiate. I've been involved in consulting on negotiation deals for big multinational companies with biggest retailers. And uh, our business at that point in time, back in 2020, was heavily, like 95% physical, like face-to-face -face delivery. So it's either consulting or workshops. And um, yeah, I remember it well, how it affected business and how it managed to restructure itself like this, rebuild, renew, restart and continue. So I was involved in uh, development of a program and facilitating it purely online so exact workshop that was supposed to be happening within three and a half days was then made into a six days of online experience so what fascinated me is that the effect is 100 percent the same so i knew that it is absolutely real to do to conduct business being online and in an entire like different location. So I'm currently located in New Delhi in India. I've arrived here on Saturday. It's a little other story. But yeah, well hell why not? So I arrived on Saturday. And uh, it was a connection flight from Vilnius where I reside. So yeah, Vilnius, let's scroll back a bit. And uh, maybe I'll remember that those other stories at some point in time. So we're we're there in Istanbul. We're deciding like what, what are we gonna do? And I understand that I can work remotely. Whereas my wife cannot, moreover, she works for state-owned companies. So they issue a policy that uh, you need to come back and work physically from the jurisdiction of uh, motherland. Motherland being Mother Russia, of course. And we think, what are we going to do? So we discuss, brainstorm, and we decide that, uh, well, it's my wife's decision, she decided to quit the job and I fully supported her in this decision because for me as I said earlier it was a point of no return so I couldn't have even imagined living my further life in Russia I have my my mother and my sister they still live in Russia and um, you know being transparent here probably chased the fucking government at some point but hey what are you gonna do can't hold it any longer. Science talk through. <laughs> so anyway, 
At Franz, I have business. My business at that point in time, 100%, was involved in Russian structures and we work with only commercial sectors, so we never work directly with governmental institutions. There were some projects of educational type, however, we haven't done any strategy or marketing strategy for state-owned companies. Well, at least to the best of our knowledge, anyway. And um, so I immediately realized, and I think I tend to believe that I'm a pragmatic person, I think a bit up front. So I recognize that there are significant consequences to those decisions in terms of the economy. And uh, even though my, my friends, my colleagues may say that I'm being like, paranoid or like pessimistic, I tend to think differently because at that point in time I realized that that's it. Especially after some time that you know some companies decided to immediately withdraw business. My view was like that's it. I mean the com the country is getting isolated one way or the other and the consequences are growing stronger day by day of the continuation of uh, war of war, what they call in Russia special military fucking operation which is like a construct that was pretty much invented to avoid all legal casualties so it's not like war it's not like military related I don't know state whatever the fuck in the bureaucratic level that means so legally there is no fucking war I mean imagine this this is the absurdity of the situation so anyway um, we sit there in Istanbul um, that apartment and uh, pretty much depressed trying to understand like how much money we have with us how much money can we withdraw from idioms because they are starting to appear news about big uh, giants like Visa, MasterCard, finally considering, you know, discontinuing business with Russian banks. Not after 2014, but yeah, hell, why now? Why not? Guess it was a red line for them as well. And they decide to kind of cancel Russia and discontinue Swift service. And um, we don't have much cash with us. So we start to run around and withdraw cash from our bank accounts. I'm not a rich person, that's for sure. However, I'm not that poor, I guess. I mean, I'm not coming from a privileged family. I come from the outskirts of an industrial city. I made my way through by myself, but with an insane help of my mother. To her, I'm grateful till the day I die. At some point in time, I so my mother was born on January 1st and at some point in time I, I was high on MD on a beach in Goa with my mates. It was January 1st and then I call my mother and I say congratulations and I tell her thank you for giving birth to me. I mean, if not immediately but I bet at some point, well, indirectly, got verified, but at some point she realized that I was on something. <laughs> it wasn't just some line you accidentally drop in the middle of the conversation. So yeah, anyway, going back to the decisions that we made in, uh, in, in Istanbul. So we, we tried to get as much money as we could, and then think of plans, like further plans. So we had like no plans <laughs> at that point in time. So just to remind you, we had our dog with the sitter in Moscow next to our apartment. We were paying her on a daily basis for doing this because we didn't expect that it would kind of last, let's put it this way. So we'll, we're worried about our dog and yeah, I mean, a lot. However, we're worried about our future because we don't know, like, what the fuck literally are we gonna do? So we sit and think and I, I say that I continue just, you know, working remotely and doing the things I'm doing because this is the only thing I can do right now, regardless of the location. I mean, I'm not going back to Russia, that's it. <laughs> the rest, we need to figure. So my wife is totally on board with that. And you can ask her at some point in time if she decides finally, finally, to join this podcast because originally my mate advised that my mate Ragavander advised me that I should be doing this podcast with her. However, 
her le level of English language knowledge is not that high than mine, but that's not the problem. The problem is that she's shy, and it's hard for her to overcome this maybe not sense of shyness or some other sense. I don't know. I don't want to say for her, nevertheless. So she can verify <laughs> that it was her idea, not not only mine that I imposed on her. And uh, we think about the options at our hands. So I think like Turkey, maybe. Let's let's see Turkey, why not? And um, we start to look at the options and uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm a heavy user of LinkedIn for many, many, many years. One thing you need to know about LinkedIn in Russia is that it got banned after, actually I'm not sure it was 2016 or 14 or Anyway, there was a law that was obliging big corporate companies to store data on their servers located in Russia. And Microsoft said, fuck you, we're not going to do this. So LinkedIn got banned because it wasn't a big revenue stream for them. And they, they decided like, hey, heck, we can pretty much let it slide and not even fight for it. There's no need. And I reached out on LinkedIn to my wider network and I say, like, guys is there anybody boys girls whoever ever can anybody help me like I'm in dire need and then an ex colleague of mine from the company I worked at reaches out and says there is a program that allows to relocate businesses from jurisdictions like Belarus and Belarus is a different topic even though, again, I'm a Russian citizen, I was fully aware of what was happening in Belarus back in 2020. And I, I cheered for them. I, I, like, seriously, I hope they have the momentum, they can keep it going, and they're gonna make this change happen for Svetlana Tikhanovsky to take over, because this was, like, the only legal way. But, of course, the system responded not in kind. So anyway, so there is this background of, com of relocating businesses from Belarus to Lithuania and then on that background there was an immediate kind of decision made to relocate Russian businesses that want to basically leave the country and stop paying taxes in Russia. So I say yeah, let's do it, sure. And my Schengen visa is expires on at that point in time on March 12th which means that after March 12th I won't be able to kind of enter the country by myself without having a prior permission and given the momentum going and the war starting I mean <laughs> it was pretty much not happening in the near future although maybe that, that was a bit of judgmental in, in terms of like exaggerating Nevertheless, that's not the case. So, the message that I posted on LinkedIn, it was dated wait, March 4th or 5th. You're not going to find it on LinkedIn right now. And the reason is that um, <laughs> while hiring a um, company consultancy that helps use LinkedIn as a B2B selling tool, one of the decisions that I made based on the feedback provided to me by the company was to get rid of political posts. And there were some posts for which, uh, well, I can tell you, you may either believe me or not, there are people in LinkedIn who can verify because there were like fights in the comments, having in mind that I made that post on February 22nd when I was departing Russia. And um, at that point in time, I felt the urgent need to say sorry on the behalf of the entire nation and I did it on LinkedIn which was strangely in, inappropriate in a sense to cross that business line but I crossed it but then again I was advised to remove it for that I'm sorry <laughs> however I guess you can find it I mean there is history of the internet right you can there is a website where you can find pretty much anything so you can find that frame cool right I got evidence <laughs> nice so one other thing is that um, that happened on March 5th and on March, yeah, on well, March 4th or something like that. I don't remember exact dates for that. So I say, yeah, sure, I'm buying tickets 
tomorrow. So it was March 5th when I had a call with my friend and decided to buy the tickets. So we spent our anniversary in a in a place that is a meat place. We tried to kind of enjoy the anniversary even though March 6th is the anniversary whereas we're sitting there on March 5th and just trying to say bye to each other because we don't know how long would it take us to see each other next time because she was going to Moscow and I was going to Lithuania so yeah it was a really dark moment in there and I, I bored next morning on a flight from Istanbul to Lithuania it's a connection flight from through uh, Warsaw so I go to the uh, the guy at the customs and uh, <laughs> I give him my visa with like six more days five more days to finish and he had a lot of questions trust me and I was shitless scared but luckily I had my previous experience that helped me go through it to manage the nerves of it in the moment so I got in Lithuania and ever since I've been living there I have uh, returned to Russia to Moscow to my hometown to make arrangements for selling an apartment and uh, you know tying loose ends pretty much but then ever since I've been living in Lithuania and I have spent a really interesting time in, in Thailand and in, in India and it got me thinking about a lot so the war happening in the background us living in Lithuania experiencing this life of immigrants in another country which is not Russophobic or anything against what people may be thinking and afraid with no money because I arrive there and there is a decision to cancel all Visa MasterCards issued by Russian banks as of March 10th so I arrive in Lithuanian Vilnius on March 6th which is Sunday if I remember correctly on March 7th I'm running around the city of Vilnius trying to get some cash withdrawn from ADMs because at that point in time I had only 500 euro in my pocket that's it and I had a hard time <laughs> because none of the ADM none of the ADM seems to work the reason being is that Lithuanian central bank or chief financial institution that I don't know proper name of decided to you know make a preemptive measure step and just cancel all Russian cards right away straight away without waiting for the EU to decide and it was a tough time I tell you I mean of course it's not as if I was being bombarded by Russian missiles living in Ukraine I get it I mean shit it's just something even even way more harder that I I can imagine But yeah, I mean, still do complain <laughs> about various topics. So yeah, going back to that motherfucker. So one thing that he really managed to accomplish, like in a really proper manner, if you know what I'm saying, is that he made a self-fulfilling prophecy of Russophobia. And I'm not going to complain about it. I understand the emotional reasons behind it and cases. This is not the point I'm trying to convey here. The point I'm trying to convey here is that before his actions of 2022 and 2014, there was no such strong substance for the world, you know? Like, the reason to believe is mainly, well, 2008, actually, if I'm being completely honest here, almost forgot about that myself, my mates chilling and getting high. 
on a in a kitchen, yeah, I'm watching a telly. And there's like fucking war happening in Georgia. Like, what the fuck? But at that point in time, I was uh, I was 22 years old, and um, I don't know. It just somehow it kind of evaded me in terms of perception of the heaviness of this like occasion back in the day, as it did with other occasions, of course. But still. I mean, if it, if it wasn't for this, it was mainly like Soviet background, especially for, well, Lithuania, of course, if I remember correctly, 14 people died fighting for their independence under Soviet tanks. For 16, was it? I heard a story about the guy, well, they were being chased by the, by the, I don't know, legal system, basically, through Interpol or shit like that. And I've heard about the guy who's been like FSB guy being charged somewhere in Austria based on the warrant. And he got freed. But I may be speculating here, so you know, fact checking required. But nevertheless, so you know, got himself clean that time. So anyway, uh, outside Lithuania, Czech Republic, and. Um, well, Hungary, surprisingly, I mean, Orban, he's a really, really interesting guy. I mean, he's trying to sit on both chairs, as they say. Sorry, I'm knocking on the table nervously. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he should have some memory, like historic memory from his parents or, I don't know, friends, relatives, saying something about the horrors that happened there during the Soviet regime and maybe you shouldn't be that trustworthy and in the pocket of certain individuals, you know. I'm not insinuating anything here. It's a disclaimer. But, you know, who knows? Nobody knows. So, uh, having said that, um, there is a lot of beef against Russia that happened after a series of occasions, events, starting with 2008, then 2014, and well, finally 2022, when the world started to shift. And then, when they were saying, like, there's Russophobia, there's Russophobia, there was no reason to believe in that sense. And now, look around, <laughs> there it is, flourishing. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, he made it happen, pretty much. He is the only reason that this is happening. Well, not only, I mean, of course, there are certain individuals, but then again, you can argue about that. And talking about the so loved, so called unanimous support of Vladimir Putin or war. Forget about that shit. This is pure shit. And I can prove it. So the reason is that there are two ways of Russian propaganda machine. So there is an internal way and there is an external way. So the internal way is telling people that there is this big, strange, weird and really irrational, you know, harming, kind of perverted West world that is somewhat threatening to the lives of their children, which condenses in a nutshell, in a phrase similar to something like they make children decide on sex or, sorry, uh, they make parents decide on the sex of their child in the kindergarten. And this is the boogeyman, pretty much. And Russia is very, un very orthodox, so it is basically orthodox church. Like, so you've heard of a phrase, orthodox, so this is fucking orthodox church. And uh, it's not even Christianity, it's fucking orthodox. And uh, when you put it this way, it kind of gives you an idea that people would absolutely go strongly against that idea. So this is the internal machine. And of course, there are some oil that is used and some woods that are being thrown from time to time which are highlighting the double-faced nature of the West world, 
Meaning they try to use occasions where West did something like this and said something like this. And they try to kind of run parallels that, ooh, there you go, double face, double standards, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the, um, the jokes are in Russian in the population because they are the ones living according to the double standards. Uh, they, they say, there is a saying, you would notice a pin in somebody's eye, but you won't notice a wood in your own. Shitty translation. I hope you get the meaning so yeah people just don't recognize it so there is one way the propaganda machine works and they say you know look this bad west they, it perverts your children it's lgbtqi plus uh, propaganda the rainbow is being used to kind of like what's the word for it in english like uh, put some beams on you and make you like think differently and start all of a sudden fuck man but I mean for man mainly it's their ego of course that's being kind of injured what they don't recognize is that they typically say to all those people like fuck you in the ass and then you're like wow that's some solid thinking behind what you're saying man like really kudos to you but yeah, on a side topic, um, so there's this one way. So the other way is telling to the entire population, uh, well, first of all, Western countries that consist of EU countries mainly and US, well, but it's further, it's still different narrative. So the narrative is that there's unanimous support. There's unanimous evidence that, you know, 84% or whatever, I heard the woman saying in park in Lithuania she was just discussing it with her friend she was saying 84% support Putin was like fuck you don't even know what you're talking about like market research is a topic that I'm familiar with reason being is that I used to work at Nielsen and Nielsen is widely known for pretty much marketing research marketing research methods so if you ever heard of um, TV meters or if you've ever watched um, Rain Man right what's the name of the movie with Dustin Hoffman so if you've seen that one at some point in time they get to a house and they act as if they're from Nielsen <laughs> so Nielsen knows shit in terms of research qualitative quantitative methods approaches there's this specific method that I'm a big fan of called neuroscience and there's this guy that was originally behind the product there's this Indian guy I completely forgot his name it esca escapes my mind however I will remember it at some point in time and, and bring it up to one's attention so yeah going in that direction I know how marketing research works and I know how sociological methods work so I know if a company that conducts research on behalf of the government is um, pretty much state-owned, state-controlled, and uh, that people cannot say in the open that there is war happening because they may literally go to jail for five years there is an article introduced with the war happening in russia not article like a new law so the idea of this law is to basically not let people say shit out loud so if you've ever like read book by george orwell 1984 if you ever wanted to feel what it's like it is like this of course there will be people throwing tomatoes or tomatoes at me but uh, hey it's my opinion just one russian guy of 146 or whatever million people so fuck it discredit it anyway point is that 
when the narrative's controlled, when you cannot say that you don't support war, you cannot go to the streets, legally speaking, of course, and uh, protest and say that you're against war, you're, I don't know, a peacemaker, you want peace, and uh, you'll get jailed, you'll get sentenced, and uh, you, your life will be pretty much thrown away. And people in Russia, they have this traumatic experience of 90s. So there's this TV show done by, well, it's TV series, or I don't know how properly it's called, done by BBC, 90s Trauma Zone or something like that. So it depicts pretty much what it's like, you know, being there. And yeah, I said in my description, I, I felt it. I mean, my, my father, in 1998, where there was a default to the economy <laughs> basically a russian ruble went bankrupt say bye bye kaput and uh, my my father lost his job he was working as a chief cook at the canteen at the production line in the manufactory in the Ekaterinburg. and he couldn't recover he started drinking and at some point in time became a problem so my mother gave him an ultimatum like decide <laughs> family or booze he decided booze and you know well it's not that he decided However, he wasn't able to overcome his feelings, I guess, anxiety or whatever feelings he was experiencing back in the day. So eventually he died in 2003. It was the first year when I started my education. And on November 7th, I come, my first year in the university, my mother tells me, father died. And I'm just crumbling there at the entrance inside my apartment, oh, my mother's apartment. So yeah, um, yeah, what I was talking about. So yeah, the second direction about that, the narrative that's being conveyed that, you know, there's unanimous support of 84% of people that are strongly, you know, in the favor of the current regime and whatever the fuck they're doing. And, um, you know, have, has anybody seen the data? Has anybody tried to un unveil or uncover, unearth what lies under those numbers? Like, how's the form being built? What are the questions being asked? What is the method being used? What are the restrictions in place? And then, you know, think fucking logically or use just common sense. I mean, imagine like truthful data coming from 1984 Orwell, right? Would you believe it? Yeah, I have doubts, I have doubts. So anyway, going back to that, I'm um, being distracted by some local guys here making jokes. Um, shit, yeah, so a friend of mine, a friend of mine did a research funded by himself. He like used his own funds to do it. He's an expert in marketing research and he did a study. The study was uncovering like pillars of the support. So there's a word called Ustanovki, which is a Russian word. There is an English word um, not like values, because those are not values. There is like core pillars of identity in a sense. And um, once you go to that level, you start to understand what do people really support? Like what exactly, specifically, in terms of phrases do they support so he did a study and if it is of any interest to you next time maybe or at some point in time i can like walk you through it and tell you like how to read it translate it on the go because it deserves attention and it basically tells you that like the core like target audience pretty much in terms of marketing expertise and knowledge and vocabulary sits under roughly one-fourth of the population. 
So there are strong supporters, but not of war per se. And again, I can walk you through it and un unveil it to you because it is done properly with the quality knowledge of statistic methods. And you know, it speaks for itself. So anyway, um, don't trust everything you hear about the unanimous support uh, from within Russia. It's like total bullshit. So um, yeah, trying to wrap up here, not to make it like extremely long. Oh shit! Perfect timing. Power off. Thank you. <laughs>